Most of you will know that Home Assistant is at the center of my home automation setup, but there's so many other amazing apps and services that go into making up my smart home. So today I want to take you through and show you all of the apps and services that I use on a daily basis in my home lab, from hosting to media to firewalls to storage and so much more. The first thing that makes sense to show you that I use in my home lab is my dashboard, which is actually a very recent addition for me personally, after I watched my friend Tim's home lab tour that he made a while back and saw that he was using a dashboard app to organize all of his services. And you all know that I am a sucker for a good dashboard. So I decided to add it to my stack. Like I say, only a very recent addition as I've never really had a need for a dashboard because I'll let you in on one little secret about me. There are three things in life that I have an insanely good memory for, passwords, car number plates, and IP addresses. Everything else can't remember goes in one ear, out the other, but those three things, all right up here. Does anyone else have that where it's just like a couple of really oddly specific things that they have a really good memory for, and then everything else is just gone? For my dashboard, I looked at several options out there, but settled in on Homer which is a clean, simple to use, and pretty customizable link organizer, which is basically what I am using it for, a quick landing page with links to all of the various apps and services I use on a daily basis. But you can do some more advanced things with it for certain services like gather statistics and check the status, but I am basically just using it for link organization at the moment. The thing that I like about it is that you can group things logically. So you can see I have grouped by core services, apps, and then media for my house, and then the same again for another location, so I can quickly see which one is which when I'm managing both locations. Speaking of different locations, actually, we need to take a slight detour here, just so I can explain the setup in case you are unawares. Essentially, I have two physical locations. Actually, it's four different locations, but for simplicity's sake, let's just stick with two each with their own servers and storage and network and internet connection that operate independently of each other. But these are then permanently connected together over a site-to-site -site VPN to create extensions of each other as if they were all on the same network, which makes managing everything much simpler, but also means that you can share resources like compute and storage, which we will get into in a little bit. This is great, for example, if I want to access a server in my house to do some updates, let's say, and then I think, oh, why don't I just go and apply those updates to the server at my parents' house? I can just access that server as normal through the IP without connecting to a VPN at their house, then doing the updates and then disconnecting to get back on my server. It all just works seamlessly. By the way, let me know as we go through these if you are interested in them and you want more information or a guide on any of these things, and maybe we can do that in a future video. First up, let's talk about hypervisors and virtualization, which is the backbone of a lot of home labs. And I am currently using Proxmox version eight, which just came out a few weeks back for all of my virtualization in my home lab, which I'm sure lots of you are too. Proxmox is probably one of the, if not the most popular hypervisors among enthusiasts, I would say. And I actually only recently switched to Proxmox myself, probably around two to three years ago now, back in 2020, when we were all stuck inside a bit more and I wanted some fun projects to do. And before that, I was using ESXi and vCenter for about six or seven years, as that is what we use in my day job and I was extremely familiar with that. But Proxmox is great for home labs use and I've been really enjoying it using it so far and that's what I would recommend to pretty much everyone to use currently. At my own house, I have a single Proxmox server that is enough for pretty much everything I need and all of the VMs I need to run on it. And then at the remote site, we have a dual server clustered with high availability, meaning that either server can fail and it will pick right back up without any downtime. I did experiment creating a cluster between all three servers and it did work, but I definitely needed an upgraded internet link at the remote site before that can be a permanent solution. And the advantage of that would be that I could move all of the VMs around to any of the other servers, which would be real cool for updates where I need to reboot or shut down or for maintenance or just if a server died, but that will need to wait for the future. I'm currently in the process of rebuilding it at the moment, but I also use Proxmox backup server for doing the backups and restoring the appropriate VMs where needed on all three servers. For storage, I am a big, big fan of TrueNAS. TrueNAS or FreeNAS as it used to be known back in the day is something that I've been using for a long, long time now. 
Dating all the way back to like 2013, when I first installed FreeNAS 8.2 or 8.3, I want to say, and it's had a permanent home in my home lab ever since then. And we actually even have a few of their several hundred terabyte enterprise versions at work now, which is pretty cool to see. And at the moment, I have switched over to TrueNAS Scale from TrueNAS Core, pretty much since TrueNAS Scale was announced, partly because I like to try new things, partly because I am more familiar with Linux over FreeBSD, and mostly because of the better Docker and app support over the older jails found in Core. This time we have one TrueNAS server at my house where I store all of my media and important photos and memories, footage from this channel, which takes up a lot of space now, backups, downloads, and that type of thing. And we also have a TrueNAS at the remote site too, which on top of that, also acts as storage for the Proxmox servers to help with the high availability stuff and act as a backup target for the VMs. The great thing about having a TrueNAS in both locations is that I can replicate them, meaning that anything that gets stored on one of them, I can have them replicate with each other nightly so that all of my important stuff like photos is automatically sent to that offsite remote location for safekeeping, giving me another copy of my data. The built-in replication of TrueNAS is definitely one of my favorite features alongside snapshots. Let's talk about firewalls next. You guys know I love my firewalls, and for my main firewall, I am using OpenSense, which was actually another fairly recent switch for me alongside Proxmox. Been using OpenSense for around two years now after I made the switch from PFSense, which I had also been using since back in 2011, 2012, so a good 10-year stint on PFSense before switching over to OpenSense for a few reasons. Firstly, OpenSense is updated far more frequently than PFSense, so I wanted to see how much of a difference there was. Secondly, it was around the time PFSense started making some changes to their licensing type and their open nature, which I and many others didn't like the direction it was kind of going, as well as various other dramas. So I decided to give OpenSense a shot and it's been great. OpenSense currently handles my gigabit fiber connection without issue, along with multiple VPN links, all of which can use the full bandwidth of that connection without being throttled or limited, which was a really important feature for me to have. Most of the links use OpenVPN. I have been meaning to switch over to WireGuard, but OpenVPN is so stable and I can already fully utilize the link speed as is, and I'm super familiar with OpenVPN, so it has been quite low on the priority list for me, but I'll get around to switching over to WireGuard one day. The one VPN that does use WireGuard is the link out to a public VPN provider that I use where I can route certain devices if I want to. So for example, I can route one of the TVs in the house through the VPN connection by toggling a switch if I want to see different content on Netflix, for example. Super handy. OpenSense also has their really cool Zen Armor available for application control, analytics and SSL inspection, as well as various other features, if you are into that, which I also like to use. Like I mentioned, my firewall has a permanent site-to-site -site VPN connection to the remote site, which is connected to a firewall on the other side, which of course is obviously another PFSense. Awkward. In my defense, I did have this one also switched over to OpenSense, but there is this one tiny application that PFSense seems to do better, which is IGMP proxy, which I need to have on the other side for IPTV on the remote site. Tried using it on OpenSense, but there was some sort of bug that I spent hours troubleshooting and couldn't ever get working, so I had to switch it back to PFSense. PFSense is great and everything, and I do love PFSense. It's a solid firewall, and I would keep using it but one day it would be nice to have it on OpenSense. For home automation, you all of course know that I use Home Assistant on the daily, so I won't spend too much time on this one, but if you are new, Home Assistant is an open source project for home automation, aiming to connect all of your smart home devices together into a single platform, whilst giving you access to some of the most powerful automations out there right now. Super customizable, extremely fast, and is constantly being improved. Been using Home Assistant for like five or six years now, never looked back and can't wait to see what's next. Nextcloud is another open source solution that I've been using for a really long time. And Nextcloud is a free, private and local alternative to something like Google Drive or Dropbox, giving you a place to dump files or photos and have them automatically sync to any device you have and be instantly available. 
I personally switch between working on a laptop and a desktop a lot throughout the course of a day. So if I'm working on something, I can just chuck it on Nextcloud and within a few seconds, it will appear on the other machine and I can keep on working. I also use it as a way of sharing the original high quality photos of our son and other memories with Sarah since everything is stored locally on my own hardware. It's also, ha it's also got a really cool feature where you can automatically back up photos that you take on your phone, for example, and have them sync over to Nextcloud so they are immediately backed up. I have Nextcloud running as a Docker app on TrueNAS because that's where my main storage is, meaning that it all gets backed up through replication and sent to the other remote site and is easily updatable through their app catalog. Bitwarden is another on the list, another amazing open source project like many of the other things that I use. And I use Bitwarden as my password manager of choice. And I even managed to get all of my family to switch over to Bitwarden 2, which as you all know, is no small feat to get everyone to drop what they were using and switch over. So they have been really enjoying it and I have been enjoying that too. You can run the self-hosted version of Bitwarden, which is free and it runs on your own hardware, it means you are totally in control of all of your data. And that is what I used to do, but I actually migrated over to the paid version of Bitwarden on their platform as I wanted to pay to support the project, but also I just didn't want to have to manage the security of the passwords on my own hardware and setting up VPNs and trying to get other members of the house to use VPNs and then try and explain how that all works. It was just easier to migrate to Bitwarden and have them handle everything. Bitwarden works on phones, tablets, laptops, basically anywhere and has just been killer for me for the last few years. For DNS for my house and for ad blocking services in the house, I use AdGuard, which always works well. One of those things that you can just leave running for years in the background and it just does its thing. It's got a nice integration with Home Assistant actually, meaning that you can automate certain aspects of it or provide controls to regular users, which is useful and basically just does what it should. As for media, I am actually in a little bit of a transition phase at the moment. I have been a long time Plex user since about 2013, but the last four, five, six years, they have just been slowly wearing me down to the point where I am done and I am switching. With just these like super minor but really annoying little things like constantly signing you out of your own server, which wouldn't be so bad if they didn't continuously beg you to sign in all the time and buy a Plex Pass to play media which is stored on your own local hardware. The constant pushing of their Plex streaming thing which no one was asking for and just adding other useless features rather than the things that users have actually been requesting and bugs that users have actually been requesting, all of which has just led me to switch over to Jellyfin. Jellyfin is basically what Plex should be like and what it used to behave like way back in the day when it was on top, just no nonsense playback of your media stored on your server without any of that signing in or Plex pass nonsense. They've got apps now on pretty much most devices, which is where Plex used to be king as it just worked on everything. And they've also got a nice customizable UI that's easy to use. Now, I do mention that I am in the transition phase as I do occasionally find things that Jellyfin struggles to play back for some reason where Plex doesn't. So in that case, I just switch over to Plex, watch that one thing and then switch back to Jellyfin. But I think that's more of a config issue on my side that I haven't had time to yet dig into. So once I get that down, Jelly will, Jellyfin will be the go-to for media. Both Jellyfin and Plex are available as Docker apps right now from TrueNAS once again. Makes sense to run them on TrueNAS since that's where all of my media is located in the first place. Finally, we have Unify controllers at each site for managing Unify hardware. Mostly I only use wireless access points since I'm not a huge fan of their switches, but wireless stuff is pretty good. Been using it for years once again, like I'm sure lots of you have too, as it's really popular among home labbers for good reason. One site has a physical cloud key Gen 2 for management, while the other just runs a Unify controller in a Docker container in a VM for managing the kit at each site respectively. And there we go, that was a quick look at pretty much everything I use in my home lab. There was probably a few things I missed somewhere, but that is the most important things, I think. Let me know down in the comments how many of these you are also using in your home lab, if any. I suspect a lot of these will be pretty popular with many of you. And also let me know if any of these were of interest and you'd like to know more information and do a bit more of a deep dive into some of them. And we can maybe do that in some future videos. If you would like to, that could definitely be fun. 
I did also notice a bit of a theme as we were going through these. Either it's stuff I've used for like 10, 11, 12 years and been with for a very long time, or it's like stuff I've migrated to after using something else for like 10 years just because I fancied a little bit of a change. So I did think that was quite interesting. I think True Naz must be the thing that stuck with me for the longest time. Either that or PS Sense, since I'm technically still using that. Yeah, been with those two for a very long time and still really enjoy using them. Anyways, I think that's about it for this video. I think this was about the longer run. I hope you enjoyed it. Please drop this video a like and get subscribed if you haven't already. And I will see you in the next video.